I Atop Bethel Church, the most heralded, the most despised talk show in all of human history. This is the talk show Hell Hates. This is Pastor Mike Online. And here we are coming to you live from our top secret broadcasting bunker here at Area 52. This is Pastor Mike. I'm online and I am live with you today. I wasn't live Tuesday. Uh, we had some inclement weather that rolled in. Uh, we had a bunch of snow that came in. And then, uh, so Tuesday, I recorded um, a Pastor Mike Online broadcast, uploaded it. And then I got the tractor out and had to blade off our driveway. We have a very large driveway because where we live, we live behind Sweetie Pie's parents. We've, we've lived there for, well, since not too long after we got married, which was in 87. I think we've lived there probably since 1988, somewhere around in there. And, um, so anyway, it's got quite a large driveway. So I plowed all that off Tuesday. <clears throat> and then yesterday, Woden's Day, we, we got what's called freezing rain. And what happens is the air temperature at 30,000 feet or wherever the clouds are is above freezing. So the precipitation falls as rain or drizzle. When it hits the surface down below, it was about 15 degrees Fahrenheit, which is below freezing, way below freezing. I don't know what that is Celsius, but it was 15 degrees below uh, the freezing point, 32 degrees. So when the rain and the drizzle hits, it turns to ice immediately. And so yesterday, um, Brother Sterling, God bless this man. He is, that, he is of that generation that's just tough. You just can't, you can't break them. You can't bring them down. He has recovered from COVID, he spent seven weeks in the hospital because it practically destroyed his lungs. They sent him home on hospice, and we are thinking the worst. Well, he decided, and I, think, I guess God helped him, he wasn't ready to just roll over turned his toes up and that's it so he started getting better now he is he is uh, pretty much attached to a pretty good size oxygen machine to provide enough oxygen for him uh, to, to live and as long as he's on that, he's pretty much, he's, he's homebound. He's got a long hose. It'll stretch all through his house. It'll stretch down to his garage, things like that. Well, be, probably because he had been laying around for so long, he developed a hernia just below your belt line. And he had to have surgery on that. They had scheduled the surgery for yesterday, worst, the worst possible day that could schedule it because that's when the freezing rain came down. So my wife and her sister drove Brother Sterling up about 30 miles north to St. Anthony's Hospital and they did his surgery. It's outpatient, obviously. This man has a heart condition and he, you know, his lungs are practically destroyed from COVID. So they do a major operation on him and decide they're not going to keep him overnight. They send him home. So after they got up there, uh, my wife left and came back home and came over and talked to me and said, it is freezing rain out there. And I said, you're not driving in that. So I, I drove Sweetie Pie back up north about 30 miles 
And uh, after recovery, it took him about two and a half hours to really fully recover. He was in a lot of pain. And we loaded him up in the in our uh, four. We have a four wheel drive vehicle and uh, very slowly and steadily. It was one of those things where the sleet was the, the rain was coming down and the wipers we're trying to wipe it off, but because it was so cold outside and you're traveling, the wind's blowing, the, and I've got the defrosters on high, and it's glazing up my windshield to where I can't see. And so I, at, after going so long, I had to slow down to about 20, 25, 30 miles an hour just to be able to defrost the ice from the outside of the window. So that's basically where we are. I tweeted a picture of our church parking lot this morning. And if you go on Twitter or, or Facebook, you'll be able to see it. Uh, if, you go to, if you don't follow Twitter or Facebook, go to BethelChurchMo.com and all of my Twitter feeds are there. You can click on that. You can see the picture of our parking lot. What you're seeing is not snow. The snow was bladed off. What you're seeing there is a solid sheet of ice. And ice is dangerous to drive in. Uh, there was a lot of accidents everywhere yesterday. If you get a lot of freezing rain, as some areas that I've seen, uh, Pastor, that, Pastor John Uter down in Lebanon, Missouri, which is southwest Missouri towards Springfield, they had a freezing rain storm that literally it broke power lines and it downed trees everywhere. Pastor John ended up with um, a branch of a tree poking through his kitchen ceiling. It had gone through the roof and was poking through the ceiling. Naturally, they were out of power for about a week and a half. And in some places, and I've seen this before, I've seen it um, in... Um, eastern central Arkansas toward or eastern central Oklahoma toward the Arkansas border. I've seen it in Lebanon. It breaks the trees down so bad you can't even walk through the woods. So freezing rain can do, I, I would rather drive in snow than freezing rain. Freezing rain is, is very evil. It's very terrible. All right. Uh, we're going to get into, I've been doing a study of Jeremiah. And in the last two Pastor Mike Online broadcasts, I brought up some issues, and I think I'm going to try to coagulate some things today for you. We're going to be in the scriptures today again, um, either looking at some things that we've never seen before or reminding ourselves of things that we have read and studied before. Before I get into that, we are going to do another feeding next week. Uh, this time we're going to add sugar uh, to the, the meal packets that we give out. We hand out maize, which they use to make a pour. Some of them make a porridge with it. Um, I can't remember the type of, um, oh, what else they do with it. I can't remember the word for it. Um, but, I, and, and it's sort of like grits. Now I like grits. I love how many grits. But I like it sweet. I like it with a little sugar in it or a little honey, which is pretty good. So we're going to add some sugar to that, and that's going to raise the cost of it. But we plan on feeding another 1,200 families. Uh, that'll be next week. Now, we are going to, uh, I'm going to talk to the board uh, this Sunday about making plans to purchase a shipping container, a large shipping container that would house, number one, a new radio station office so that we wouldn't have to pay rent and nobody can kick us out anymore. Um, number two, it will also be a place where we can distribute food on a regular basis. I feel like the Lord is leading us in that direction. I'm going to talk to the, in the multitude of counselors, there's safety. I have a, a board here at the church of good men. They love the Lord. They love our church. They love me. They support what we're doing. 
And on decisions like this, where we're going to spend, you know, a little bit of money, um, I don't make that decision by myself. And so we're going to meet and we're going to discuss that. But more than likely, we're going to proceed with purchasing a shipping container, turning it into a our radio station office, and then use the other half for a food distribution center. Once we have that in place, then we will plan to drill a well in Turkana. Now, remember, Turkana is a very arid, dry desert place. But you can dig a well there. I'm not sure how far we're going to have to look. I told Michael about it this morning. And we're going to start the process of looking into drilling a well. Now, this won't just be for our radio station. This will be along with the food distribution that we do in Kenya. So, in other words, in this one location, we will, dis we will distribute food. And it will be a place where people can come and get water. Practically everybody, I won't say everybody in Kenya, but a lot of people in Kenya carry these big five-gallon jugs. And they go someplace, maybe a, a river, creek, or runoff stream, or whatever, and they get their water. The problem is, I've been to Kenya. I've watched guys wash their motorcycles, their cars, people dump their sewage in it. It's not clean water. So we're, that's something that we are planning on. It's something we are praying about, something that uh, we feel like maybe God is leading us in that direction. We want you to help us pray about that. It, if God's in it, God will provide the means for it, is what I absolutely firmly believe. And so just help us pray about that and the plans uh, that we have for our ministry in Kenya. We've already drilled a well in um, uh, Samburu, Kenya, and it's a community access well. That means anybody can come and get water from that well. We want to do the same thing in Turkana along with the food distribution, so help us pray about that. Let me put, um, let's see here. Let me put something up on the screen here. Um, our study in Jeremiah uh, took us in places. I kept mentioning a certain group of people, a nation, that God said he was going to send to this world, to literally to Jerusalem, to Judah, to Israel. And when you look at the scripture, now remember the rules. Job said it, for God speaketh once, yea, twice, in a dream or a vision. He also said in Psalms, um, God has spoken once, twice have I heard this, that power belongs unto the Lord. So we have, when you think about it, we have God speaking once, that's the Old Testament. God speaking twice, that's the New Testament. When Moses delivered the commandments to the Israelites, how many times did he do it? Twice. The first time the, the commandments were broken, the second time the commandments were received. So what you have is these patterns in the Bible of God showing you how he works, how prophecy works. While you have some who look at Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Isaiah, Hosea, they look at those prophecies and say they have already been fulfilled. There's nothing left there. And that was what was in my mind years ago when I would read them. It just bore me to death. And I'm going, why am I reading this? It's already happened. Big whoop. But then God showed me that there is a partial fulfillment and a perfect fulfillment. These words in Jeremiah, in Ezekiel, in Isaiah, in the Old Testament, I would say are more valid now than they ever have been in history. This Bible is more accurate, more right, more in step, 
um, more relevant with what's going on in this world than at any other time in human history. While you have churches all over the world telling you, well, that, you know, the things in the Bible, that was written for the people of that day, and then it just really doesn't apply to us. I've had people tell me that their pastor told them that. A guy was going to a uh, Pentecostal church, and you had these women preaching, and these women speaking in tongues everywhere. And he approached his pastor, and he said, look right here, it says in 1 Corinthians 14, let your women remain silent in the churches. The pastor said, well, Paul wrote that for them at that time. That's not for us. Well, that was a lie. It was a lie in order for this church to be rebellious against the Lord and yet claim that God's Holy Spirit was doing the, the tongues talking and causing those women to preach behind the pulpit in that church. And this man knew it. And he's he said, I can't, I can't go to church here. He left. So these, these prophecies are right. They're relevant. They are written for us unto whom the ends of the world are come. All of these things are written for us. And I believe we're going to see them take place before our eyes. Now, as I read some of these, some of it I don't understand. It's because I can't see it. But when we see it, some of the things we can kind of get a picture. Okay, I think I get what you're saying. But when God fulfills all of these things, he will do it right in front of our eyes. And, and we'll go, this is that which was spoken by the prophet. Exactly the way Peter quoted Joel. This is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. And if you notice, the things that Joel said, not all of them happened on the day of Pentecost. So God clearly has a perfect fulfillment yet to come of his prophecy in the book of Joel. I have up on the screen Jeremiah, 45, or Jeremiah 4, which was part of our study. Verse 5, Declare ye in Judah and publish in Jerusalem and say, Blow ye the trumpet in the land. So think of the seven trumpets, the time of the translation, cry, gather together, and say, assemble yourselves, let us go into the defensed cities, set up the standard towards Zion, retire, stay not, for I will bring evil from the north a certain specific direction God said he would bring evil from. Now, why the north? Because you keep seeing that pop up, especially in Jeremiah. But that's not the only place. He said, I will bring evil from the north and a great destruction. So, um, anytime you have, let me get my pen here, anytime you have the word destruction. Think of the destroyer, the destroying angel, the destroyer that went through Egypt and the camp or the land of the Israelites in Goshen and killing every firstborn child of every household. That was the destroyer. Then you have Apollyon or Abaddon. Out of Revelation 9, 11. He is the king who is the angel of the bottomless pit. He's the king of all of those evil beasts down there. He's the destroyer, like Shiva is. The lion, look at this. The lion has come up from his thicket, and the destroyer of the Gentiles is on his way. Remember, God said, as part of the mystery, the word mystery in the Bible, God said, Beloved, be not ignorant of this mystery, that blindness in part is happened unto Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles become in. So I believe that there's a time when the last Gentile is going to be saved, the very last one. When that Gentile is saved, God is going to say, at some point, I've had it. I'm done. I'm not going to deal with the Gentiles anymore. I'm going to restore Israel. 
then I believe you'll have the second outpouring of the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit, and then you'll have the things that Joel prophesied would happen actually taking place on that day. But I believe that God, just as God has put Israel in darkness and us in the light, think of, think of the earth. He used to have a, an earth pin around here with an earth globe on it. I don't see it. Here, ah, here it is. All right. So think of the earth. Think of it. So this side is in the light. Let's say that's the Gentiles. Right now the light is on the Gentiles. As the world turns, now God's shining the light on Israel and the Gentiles are in darkness. You see that? He didn't say the destroyer of Isra the Israelites. He said the destroyer of the Gentiles is on his way. And he has gone up, he has gone forth from his place to make thy land desolate, and thy cities shall be laid waste without an inhabitant. And where did he come from? Came from the north. And again, who lives up there? Nobody. Except if you believe in Santa Claus. But nobody lives up there. There is no country up there. There's no nation up there. There's no land up there. There's just ice, and that's it. Water is all you have. So Jeremiah 4.11, At that time it shall be, uh, at that time shall it be said to this people and to, and to Jerusalem, a dry wind of the high places in the wilderness toward the daughter of my people. A wind that represents a spirit. And this is a dry spirit. It has no water in it. Water is a picture of the Bible. So this is not a wind that brings moisture and dew. This is a dry wind that drives moisture away. It's a dry wind of the high places in the wilderness round toward the daughter of my people. Not to fan nor to cleanse. Even a full wind from those places shall come unto me. Now also will I give sentence against them. And behold, he shall come up as clouds and his chariots. Think about he. And in this case, I believe he's talking about Antichrist, the other Jesus. His chariots shall be as a whirlwind. Now remember, this is why I brought up the issue of the Bible, God speaketh once, yea, twice. You could say, well, when these prophecies were written, they didn't understand about tanks and armored uh, personnel carriers, and they didn't understand, you know, uh, guns, and they didn't know what helicopters were, and on and on and on. Yeah, but God did. You have to remember these are not men's words. They are God's words. And if God says them, he's not so short-sighted that he can't understand, well, I'm going to send them with swords, and, and then all of a sudden history changes, and we don't fight with swords anymore. And God says, well, boy, I put that, boy, I wrote that down wrong, didn't I? What am I going to, maybe I should have the uh, United Bible Society come and retranslate that, rewrite it. No. God knows exactly what he's talking about. He says, they're chariots. They're coming in chariots, vehicles, wheels, unidentified flying objects, because he said his chariots shall be as a whirlwind, and his horses are swifter than eagles. Woe unto us. And this is not the only time that God has ever said this. Woe unto us, for we are spoiled. O Jerusalem, wash thine heart from wickedness, that thou mayest be saved. How long shall thy vain thoughts lodge within thee? 
For a voice declareth from Dan and publisheth affliction from Mount Ephraim. Make ye mention to the nations, behold, publish against Jerusalem, that watchers come from a far country and give out their voice against the cities of Judah. Now this word watchers. I, in the Bible, I think the Bible tells us, the book of Daniel chapter 4, Four. Let me type that in. Uh, yeah, yeah, here we go. Daniel 4.13, I saw in the visions of my head and upon my bed, behold, a watcher and an holy one came down from heaven. Verse 23, whereas the king saw a watcher and a holy one. So it's possible. That when he says in verse 16 here, make you mention to the nations, behold, publish against Jerusalem, that watchers come from a far country. Now, you might say, see there, pastor, he says a country. That would imply something on the earth. Not always. And I'm going to show you that scripturally that I believe these watchers, they are coming from a far country. A country so far away, we currently can't get there, at least that I know of. And they're going to give out their voice against the cities of Judah. So number one, they're coming from the north. They're an evil nation of people. And again, you might say, well, nations are basically human people, flesh and blood people. Not necessarily. Again, the word nation also in the Bible. Let's type that in for a second. Nation. Let's look. Let's see here if I'm right. Why, I sure am. First Peter chapter 2, 9. But you are a chosen generation. That's a DNA word. A royal priesthood and holy nation, a peculiar people. And he means that in our born-again state, our spirits, we are a nation of spirits under God himself. So, here he is telling about a nation that's coming. It's an evil nation. Their chariots have the energy of a whirlwind. You know, when a whirlwind picks something up, it just, gravity means nothing. It just lifts it up. Their horses are faster than eagles, which means you can't catch them. They're very, very swift. Then he mentions these watchers coming from a far country. And I, I submit to you that I do not believe this is any earthly nation. Any earthly country. Earthly countries can be defeated. You know, I, I marvel I study World War II. It, to, to me, it fascinates me. I, I, you know, we all wish we could go back in time and live in a different time. I, I, I wish that I could live in the days of World War II. Because here we are, the United States of America. We're not really, we're not really equipped to fight a major battle anywhere. And yet we get brought in to World War II. And the United States of America defeated Britain, or excuse me, defeated Germany with Russia's help. 
And we also defeated Japan. We won that war on both sides. God truly blessed this nation. If it's an earthly nation, another earthly nation or an alliance of nations can stop it. But this is not, I do not believe this is not an earthly nation. I do not believe they are earthlings. I do not believe they are humans. I believe they are a different ethnic nation, generation, um, genealogical, genetic people. They are a different species. All together. This is what the word nation means. Here's more proof. Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 13. The word of the Lord came unto me the second time, saying, What seest thou? And I said, I see a seething pot, and the face thereof is toward the north. Then the Lord said unto me, Out of the north, an evil shall break forth upon all the inhabitants of the land. Where is it coming from? Out of the north. Same place that he said here in Jeremiah 4, an evil from the north. The lion, the destroyer of the Gentiles, a great destruction with chariots that are faster. Their horses are faster than eagles. They are watchers from a far country. Out of the north, an evil shall break forth upon all the inhabitants of the land. For lo, I will call all the families of the kingdoms of the north. Again, no nations up there. Saith the Lord, they shall come and they shall set everyone his throne at the entering of the gates of Jerusalem and against all the walls thereof round about and against all the cities of Judah. And I will utter my judgments against them, touching all their wickedness who have forsaken me and have burned incense unto other gods and worship the works of their own hands. And that includes a lot of people, especially the ones who have so much covetousness that they have idols in their heart hidden so that nobody can see them. And they think God can't see them, but God can. Now, Deuteronomy 28, remember, they, the horses are swifter than eagles. The chariot shall be as a whirlwind. Deuteronomy 28. Thou shalt beget sons and daughters, but thou shalt not enjoy them, for they shall go into captivity. All thy trees and the fruit of thy land shall the locust consume. What kind of locusts are we talking about? There are earthly locusts that do tremendous damage. But also there are spirit locusts that do far greater damage. And I'm going to show it to you from the Bible. The fruit of thy land shall... And then Deuteronomy 28, again, is the people who rejected God's covenant... They refused to do what God told them to do. They refused to believe it. They would not hold on to it. They were not re sorrowful for their sins and their actions. They just simply forsook the law, the commandment, the covenant of the Lord. And so God said, because of that, I shall send the locust and they shall consume. And the stranger... Now, let's do this. Stranger. Do your own study of this. Stranger. Uh, 129 times in the Bible. Let's look for an other word with it. Let me also do that. Job 19. They that dwell in mine house and my maids count me for a stranger. I am an alien in their sight. 
Psalm 69, 8, I am become a stranger unto my brethren and an alien unto my mother's children. Isaiah 61, 5, and strangers shall stand and feed your flocks and the sons of the alien shall be your plowmen and your vine dressers. Lamentations, our inheritance is turned to strangers, our houses to aliens. In Ephesians, we're the aliens. Ephesians 2.12, that at that time you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. And what that simply means is, is that because we are born Gentiles and not of the house and stock of Abraham, that we are strangers and aliens. We use the word alien to apply to someone who is, and in this political correct world now, they, nobody uses the word alien anymore. They're called undocumented workers. It's like, well, it's okay for them to be here. They just forgot to bring their paperwork. They are still aliens and strangers and foreigners. And that's what we are to this world. We don't belong here. Somebody say amen. We don't belong here. And I don't want to be here any longer than I have to be. I promise you that. The turmoil, the trials, the troubles that we get into God is trying to get us to let go of this world. There's nothing left for us here. So we wait patiently for when the day Christ calls our name. So you understand now the word stranger is also equally applied several times. One, two, three, four, five, six times in the Bible. It's linked to the word alien. Let's look at that verse again. Deuteronomy 28. The stranger that is within thee shall get up above thee very high, and thou shalt come down very low. Do they live among us? Well, let me ask you this question. Do angels dwell among us? Of course they do. This is why we are told to be careful to entertain strangers. What did he say? Let's go look that verse up. Very, very interesting. Be careful to entertain strangers. Let's see. There we go. Hebrews 13, 2. Be not forgetful to entertain strangers, for thereby some have entertained angels unawares. Strangers. Already here. taking on the form or already having the form of human beings. Remember, the, the two angels that came with the Lord to Abraham were referred to as men. And apparently, that's what they look like. They look like men. When those two angels made it to the city of Sodom, they came out from every quarter of the city, both young and old, for one thing. It's because those aliens or those, <laughs> those angels looked like human men. They couldn't tell the difference. So the stranger that is within thee shall get up above thee very high, and thou shalt come down very low. Now, I could go off into all these. I mean, I've, I've heard a lot of stories about underground bases, aliens living in them, 
I don't know if those are true or not. I think it's possible. I do know that we have a whole army of evil angels trapped in the bottomless pit under the earth. I do know that. Uh, so anyway, is it possible? Yeah, I'd say it's possible. Joel chapter 1, verse 3, tell you your children of it. And watch this. You, let's count this. You're the first generation. Tell your children, this, that's the second generation. And let your children tell their children, that's third generation, and their children another generation. We're four generations now. What are we telling them? We're telling them that that which the palmer worm has left hath the locust eaten. And that which the locust hath eaten hath the canker worm eaten. And that which the canker worm hath left hath the caterpillar eaten. So we have four different types of what would the Bible call them? Creeping things? Four different types tells us that these are not just earthly, three-dimensional locusts and canker worms and caterpillars and so on. We know, we know that in hell that their worms are there consuming flesh. We know that. So he says in Joel chapter uh, 1 verse 5, Awake ye drunkards and weep and howl all ye drinkers of wine because of the new wine, for it is cut off from your mouth. In other words, think about, think about it. What are the Hebrew roots people trying to get, get you to believe? They're trying to cut off the new wine from your mouth. They're trying to get you to think that the New Testament, the new covenant, is not actually a different covenant than the one from Mount Sinai. The Hebrew roots people call it the renewed covenant. They say it's the renewed Mount Sinai covenant that you must perform as many of the commandments as you possibly can. And then once you've done all of that, then Jesus will cover the rest of it, which is unbiblical. It's wicked. They're removing the new wine from people's mouths. They want them to drink the old wine. The new wine is cut off from your mouth for a nation. Look at this. A nation has come up, up. A nation has come up upon my land strong and without number. And you think about what is innumerable. Angels are. Whose teeth are the teeth of a lion and hath the cheek teeth of a great lion. Now, again, if we're to go and look at the army, and we're going to look at this later, the army uh, that is released out of the pit, we have a description of them. The shapes of the locusts were like unto horses prepared unto battle. On their heads were, as it were, crowns like gold, and their faces were as the faces of men, and they had hair as the hair of women. These are androgynous gods just like some of the gods that i'm going to be presenting to you in next week's watchman broadcast bacchus dionysus the gods of uh they're the gods of wine and drunkenness and there is a spirit that goes with them that makes you go crazy these are androgynous gods. They are both male and female in the same body. And that's what these are. Uh, and their teeth were as the teeth of lions. That is exactly, exactly 
what Joel said. Their teeth are the teeth of a lion and have the cheek teeth of a great lion. This is no ordinary army. This is no ordinary earth-born nation. It is a different breed, a different ethnic a people, a, a, a different species altogether. They're not from here. They are from either the heavens or beneath the earth. Jeremiah chapter 4, we studied this last week. Make ye mention to the nations, behold, publish against Jerusalem the, that watchers come from a far country and give out their voice against, I've already read that verse already. As keepers of a field, are they against her round about because she hath been rebellious against me, saith the Lord. You know what rebellion is? In the Bible, is not rebellion as the sin of witchcraft? You better reconsider your ideologies about submitting to earthly authorities. Yes, God does put even his saints under earthly authorities. I'm not going to get into that today because a very controversial issue. But you, God, God does not ever call us to anarchy. Ever. Now, I'm not saying that if the government forces you to do something that you know is a violation of God's word and God's commandments, like aborting a baby, then, or speaking, you know, preaching in the name of Jesus, then, then, we can stand up and say, we're going to do this because this is what God told us to do. Now, we might have to face the consequences. But yeah, clearly, we have to do what God, God's authority overrides human authority. Anyway, let me move on. Jeremiah 5.15, lo, I will bring a nation. Notice this. Jeremiah, this is what we were looking at, Jeremiah, a nation upon you from far. A second time he said it. O house of Israel, saith the Lord, it is a mighty nation. It is an ancient nation. It is a nation whose language thou knowest not, neither understandest what they say. Now again, there is no language in this world that is unknown to men to mankind it is safe to say that practically every language on this earth we know and understand except the ones that the if you remember a couple years ago facebook developed an artificial intelligence machine they they had two of them and they connected them together, and all of a sudden, those two AIs started creating their own language and started speaking to themselves in a language that the humans didn't understand. They immediately unplugged them because it freaked them out. Uh, we're going to see the prophecy of Jeremiah 5 again. So it's, an, it's a mighty nation. They come from afar. They're an ancient nation. They have a language that no one can understand. No one can. Their quiver is an open sepulcher. They are all mighty men. 
and they shall eat up thine harvest and thy bread, which thy sons and thy daughters should eat. They shall eat up thy flocks and thine herds. They shall eat up thy vines and thy fig trees. They shall impoverish thy fenced cities, wherein thou trustest with the sword. Nevertheless, in those days, saith the Lord, I will not make a full end of you. Now, again, somebody might be saying, see there, pastor, angels don't require food. Well, I would beg to differ with you. If I were to look in Genesis 18, I bet I would see angels eating a meal. Uh, in Genesis 18, verse 3, he said, My Lord, now if I found favor in thy sight, pass not away. I pray thee from thy servant, let a little water, I pray you, be fetched and wash your feet and rest yourselves under the tree. And I will fetch a morsel of bread and comfort ye your hearts. After that, ye shall pass on. For therefore are ye come to your servant, as they said, so do as thou hast said. And Abraham hastened into the tent unto Sarah and said, Make ready quickly three measures of fine meal, knead it, and make cakes upon the earth. And Sarah said, Quit telling me how to cook. I already know how to do this. That's just me adding something. Anyway, and Abraham ran into the herd and fetched a calf tender and good and gave it unto the young man and he haste to dress it. And he took butter and milk and the calf which they had dressed. They had, had steak mm -mm. and set it before them and he stood by them under the tree and they did eat steak, home baked bread. Oh my goodness. And the angels ate every bit of it. Did you not know? Let me see if I can find this. And let's see here. I know it's in the Psalms somewhere. Uh, yeah, Psalm 78, 25. Man did eat angels' food. He sent them meat to the full. The manna was the food that the angels ate. So, this nation is coming to this earth, and they're going to eat up our stuff. They shall eat up thy flocks and thy herds, they shall eat up thy vines and thy fig trees, they shall impoverish thy fenced cities, wherein thou trustest with the sword. Nevertheless, in those days, saith the Lord, I will not make a full end with you. Jeremiah 25, 9, Behold, I will send and take all the families of of the north, families, ethnic peoples, nations, a different type of nation. Saith the Lord in Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, my servant, and will bring them against this land and against the inhabitants thereof and against all these nations round about and will utterly destroy them and make them an astonishment and an hissing and a perpetual desolation. Moreover, I will take from them the voice of mirth, the voice of gladness, the voice of the bridegroom, that's Jesus, the voice of the bride, that's the church. The sound of the millstones, the light of the candle. I believe, according to John chapter 1, this is where John said, This is the light that lighteth every man that cometh into the world. I believe that every man has in him a light, the light of God that is intended to draw him and notify him of God. But I believe at some point the scriptures tell us that that candle gets blown out. Hence the word nirvana. The word nirvana means blown out as of blowing out a lamp or a candle. Now there is no light in you. Now, now everything in you is darkness. So 
when these families of the north come down and their king, that evil nation, the world's not going to have to listen to preachers anymore. There'll be no preacher, godly preachers. There'll be no godly church members to hear them sing, to hear them testify, to hear them pray. I believe those things are going to be gone. Jeremiah 10, verse 21, for the pastors are become brutish. The pastors become like beasts. That's what that word means. Like bruto, bruta, brutus in Popeye was a beast of a man. That's all he wanted was this really skinny, scrawny, ugly olive oil. What in the world did he want with her? But he was a beast of a man. That's why they called him that, Brutus. And have not sought the Lord. Therefore they shall not prosper, and all their flocks shall be scattered. Behold, the noise of the brute is come, and a great commotion out of the north country. What country is in the north? There isn't one. To make the cities of Judah desolate and a den of dragons. Now we're getting it. Now we're getting the understanding that the dragons are the ones moving in. Serpent spirits, draconians in the, in the UFO movement, they have these categories of different aliens, and one of them are the draconians, they call them, because they look like, or the reptiloids, or the reptilians, because they look like reptiles. They look like dinosaurs and dragons and serpents and lizards and all kinds of things. But they have a humanoid form, but their skin, their eyes, hands or feet are similar to that of dragons. So when this happens, they're coming out of the north. What are they? It's a nation of dragons and other types. They're, they're basically devils is what they are. They're devils. Uh, remember this from the watchman that I did. And I'm going to uh, try to record and get the next one out by Sunday. By the way, we have more weather, uh, snow coming in on Monday, but I believe we will be having service Sunday. So pray that we can. Ezekiel 8, chapter 13. He said also unto me, Turn thee yet again, and thou shalt see greater abominations that they do. Then he brought me to the door of the gate of the Lord's house, which was toward the north. And behold, there sat women weeping for Tammuz. Where were they? They were sitting at the gate of the Lord's house toward the north. And they were weeping for the dead God who wore a headband with crosses on it. Talk about a setup. Bum, bum, bum. Now, what you're looking at right here, notice these stars are all turning. Somebody opened up their camera shutter and left it open for, uh, it looks like, I don't know, 20 minutes, an hour, something like that. And they caught the motions, the circular motions of the stars in the night sky. With the exception of one star. 
That star is Polaris, what is referred to as the North Star. It never moves. It is how people learned to navigate both land and sea by using the North Star. They knew that the North Star was directly due north or close enough so they could use calculations then to calculate their exact position on the earth by using the North Star or in some cases the rising and the setting of the sun. So there's a star there. Look at this. This is the United Nations logo. It has divided the earth, one, two, three, four, eight, twelve, sixteen, twenty, twenty-four, twenty-eight, thirty-two sections, and the center point is right here at the north where nobody lives. Now, they could have included Antarctica. Doesn't really look like they did. But that's what that logo represents. The 33rd point of the United Nations logo is the North and the North Star and what I believe the United Nations is really all about. They say that it's, it's about uniting the world together so that we can, uh, so that we can not have any more World War One, World War Two, things like that. Well, it hasn't worked so well, has it? But what I believe they're really they're focusing on their real intention. is, and it may be not necessarily known to them on a conscious level, but in their spirit, because they are the children of disobedience and the prince of the power of the air rules over them, their goal is to bring all of the nations together to accept this invasion force from the north. Around, let me, sh let me go back to this. Around the North Star is the constellation Draco, the dragon. And he like does a serpentine loop around the North Star. The North Star stays fixed, doesn't move, but Draco the dragon just kind of squirms or flies around the North Star. In other words, he literally is at the North. The dragon is. Now, I like this part right here. I love this. Because Psalm 23, remember, in the wilderness tabernacle, they had furniture there that represented the Godhead, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. The Father was represented by the Ark of the Covenant, and his presence was there, seated on the Ark, seated on the Ark of the Covenant, in a uh, pillar of cloud by day, pillar of fire by night. The candlestick was always on the west, or excuse me, the south side. The Ark of the Covenant to the west. And the table of showbread, or shoebread, was on the north side. And that was directed by God. The Jews didn't make this up. Put it in the side northward. So every day, 
12 hot, fresh, baked loaves of bread sitting on that table. And at the end of the day, the priest would collect up, or maybe the next morning, the priest would collect up the old bread and set down new bread there. And of course, the priests were able to eat from the old bread. But that new bread represents Christ, and it represents the table that God has set before us. Psalm 23, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thou, uh, thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. The tables on the north side, Draco the dragon, the serpent, Satan, the wicked one, is on the north side. And Jesus says, come sit at my table. I know the enemies, I know the enemies out there. I know he's trying to defeat you. But he invites us every day to come and feed from his table with fresh bread every day. Somebody say amen. Man, you ought to get happy about something. By the way, I still haven't watched the news. I know they're trying to impeach the president right now, or President Trump, which is the, the most idiotic thing in the world to be wasting time with. Idiotic. It just, it makes me mad. I just, I don't watch it. I'd rather feed at the table of Jesus in the presence of my enemies. And you know what Jesus is doing? He's showing our enemies. Look, I'll feed my people and I'll protect them. And you're not going to touch them. They're my people. Now from, um, we're going to step out of the Bible just for a minute. This is from uh, Fat Albert Pike, his book, Morals and Dogma. This is what in Freemasonry, the North Star represents. The North Star, always fixed and immutable for us, represents the point in the center of the circle, which is a Masonic emblem, or the deity in the center of the universe. Now, don't believe that. But that's what the occultists believe. And then he said, to all Masons, the North has immemorially been the place of darkness. And of the great lights of the Lodge, none is in the North. Now, here's what's interesting to me is that the Bible says, number one, that God, and we're going to read the scriptures in a little bit, God descends from the north, number one. Number two, he covers himself with darkness. Just like written here. But in that darkness lies the evil nations or the evil families, or the evil people that is going to come to invade this world and take it over and mingle themselves, I believe, with the seed of men. Genesis 3.14, notice this. The first place God told Abram to look after Lot, he said, Lot, you choose your land. Go wherever you want to. You pick one way, I'll go the other way. And God took Abram and said, 
And the Lord said unto Abram, after that lot was separated from him, lift up now thine eyes and look from the place where thou art northward. First place he told him. Southward, eastward, and westward. Northward. Four different places. Showing us that number four always represents the spiritual realm. And he says in Hebrews 11, concerning Abram or Abraham, by faith Abraham, when he was called to go out into a place which he should after receive for an inheritance, obeyed. And he went out, not knowing whither he went. By faith he sojourned in the land of promise as in a strange country, dwelling in tabernacles with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. For he looked for a city which hath foundations, whose builder and maker is God. Now, where is that city that he was really looking for? It tells us in Hebrews eleven fourteen, For they that say such things declare plainly that they seek a country. And truly, if they had been mindful of that country from whence they came out, they might have had opportunity to have returned. But now they desire a better country, that is, an heavenly. So God doesn't just leave it up for us to guess or figure it out. He tells us in no uncertain terms that the real land that Abraham and all of the others sought for was a land in heaven in a far, far away place. Wherefore God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he hath prepared for them a city. Deuteronomy 3.27. This is what God said to uh, uh, Moses. Get thee up into the top of Pisgah and lift up thine eyes westward and northward, southward and eastward, four directions. Behold it with thine eyes, for thou shalt not go over this Jordan. See, Moses was taken up on the mountain to look in those four directions for the promised land, but he himself was not allowed to go into, I would say, the earthly promised land. But we know that he made it into the spiritual promised land. We know that because he was with Elijah who hadn't died at the Mount of Transfiguration. We know that. Now, Ezekiel chapter 1. This is, this is where God is telling us that he comes from. He comes riding in. Ezekiel sees this. He says it in verse 4. I looked and behold a whirlwind came out of the north. What did God say that the enemy's chariots are going to be like a whirlwind. Dun, dun, dun. Now, um, I'm not sure of the exact connection. I don't know if that means it has something to do with their propulsion. When Elijah was translated, let's look at that. I just thought of that. This just in. I'm getting a revelation now. And it's from Scripture. In uh, first, Second Kings chapter 2, the Bible says... Um, Verse 11, it came to pass as they still went on and talked that, behold, there appeared a chariot of fire and horses of fire and part, and part of them asunder. And Elijah went up, in, went, went up by a whirlwind into heaven. So the whirlwind, the vortex, just might have something to do 
with um how can i say this we know the whirlwind basically defied gravity on elijah's behalf because as elijah is lifted up from the earth he is obviously defying the laws of gravity and it was the whirlwind that was causing him to do this now how do um if you would allow me to just for a second if you believe this the testimony of bob lazar uh, there was a documentary done about him a couple years ago, Jeremy Corbell. There are some YouTube videos about him. He said he, he's the guy who actually for the first time ever in the late 80s revealed to the world a place, a secret base called Area 51 and a sub section of area 51 called s4 up until that time the world had never heard anything about area 51 and bob lazar said that he was hired by eg and g to work on a recovered disc he called the sport model he had names they had nine of them in these hangars and he called the one he was working on a sport model and it had an anti-gravity engine it could literally bend and fold and basically fold in the fabric of space and time and my question is, is it possible that that energy looks like a vortex? And I'll ask, I'll, say, I'll tell you why, an, another reason why I believe that. In the Hindu religion, you remember they believe in this thing called Kundalini. And in Kundalini, you have a coiled up serpent, a beast, the base of your spine. And it wants to rise up the 33 bones of your spine and give you Shakti Pot or give you open up your third eye and activate your third eye. So now you have the illumination. Now you know who you really are. Now you, you are connected with God, in other words. It's a serpent. But the serpent has to pass through what's called the seven chakras. And the word chakra literally means an energy wheel or vortex. Now, we're in Ezekiel 1. Let's look at that. Um, because I think that's there. It says, verse 15, Now as I beheld the living creatures, behold one wheel upon the earth by the living creatures with his four faces. The appearance of the wheels was, uh, and their work was like unto the color of a barrel, and they had and they four had one likeness, and their appearance and their work was as it were, and a wheel in the middle of a wheel. And when they went, they went upon their four sides, and they turned not when they went. And as for their rings, they were so high that they were dreadful, and their rings were full of eyes round about them four. So these rings or these wheels are actually living beings. They have eyes. And it also says, uh, verse 19, when the living creatures went, the wheels went by them. And when the living creatures were lifted up from the earth, the, the wheels were lifted up. 
whithersoever the spirit was to go, that they went there, thither was their spirit to go, and the wheels were lifted up over against them, for the spirit of the living creature was in the wheels. So I think these seven chakras, they call them wheels or energy vortexes. What I think they are are devils. That has something to do with the fact that these, when this army comes to invade, they're, they're bringing chariots. Not like the chariots of the Romans or the Egyptians. Something completely different. That runs on spirit power. The spirit of the living creatures was actually in the wheels, which means the wheels themselves were alive. And by the way, they were worshipped. The chariots of God are worshipped in Jewish Kabbalah. They're called the Merkaba. And in the Jewish Kabbalah, they have what's called Merkaba mysticism. And the wheels, I'm trying to remember the Hebrew word for that. Um, I can't think of it. Anyway, you can look it up on blueletterbible.org. They were worshipped as well and considered to be living beings. The wheels themselves were. But in any way, that when, when Ezekiel looked, behold, a whirlwind came out of the north. A great cloud and a fire enfolding itself, and a brightness was about it. And out of the midst thereof, as the color of amber, out of the midst of the fire, also out of the midst thereof came the likeness of four living creatures, and this was their appearance. They had the likeness of man. And I skipped through, because I read part of that to you. And above the firmament, verse 26, that was over their heads, was the likeness of a throne. As the appearance of a sapphire stone upon the likeness of the throne was the likeness as the appearance of a man above upon it. When Solomon built his temple, he literally built the thing that held up the Ark of the Covenant. He made a chariot. He literally built a chariot and put a crystal sea of glass for the firmament and set the Ark of the Covenant on top of that. Psalm 68, 17, the chariots of God are angels. The chariots of God are 20,000, even thousands of angels. So we know from scripture that the chariots that this army is bringing to this world, that they themselves are living beings. God said so. You want two witnesses? He said it in Ezekiel 1. He said it in Ezekiel 10. And he said it in Psalm 68, 17. That's three witnesses right there. Of why I believe what I believe. You see, we're not seeing and experiencing less unidentified flying object instances or occasions or incursions. We're seeing more, much more. There's more interest now in UFOs, aliens, whatever. More interest now than there ever has been in American history or any other nation's history for that matter. There are still some who think if you see a UFO, ah, you didn't see nothing. They still don't believe them. But I believe the Bible is telling us 
where this invasion force that's com- that is coming, per Daniel's interpretation of Nebuchadnezzar's dream and other places in the scripture, I believe this evil nation does not come from this earth. It comes from the heavens, comes from underneath the earth. Now watch this. Psalm 48, 2. Beautiful for situation, the joy of the whole earth is Mount Zion. And where is Mount Zion? On the north side. On the sides of the north. The city of the great king. So Mount Zion is in the sides of the north. And that's where the great king. King, capital K, so we know who that is. That's Jesus. That's his town. That's Jerusalem above, which is free. Zion. Isaiah 41, 25. I have raised up one from the north, and he shall come. From the rising of the sun shall he call upon my name, and he shall come upon princes as upon mortar, and as the potter treadeth the clay. Now, isn't it interesting that the Bible's telling you that, and I believe this is Christ, he's not only coming from the north, he's coming from the east as well. How can he do that? Well, when you're God, you just can. And when we think about, uh, let's see here, I have... A graphic. I don't know if I'm going to get through. Ah! I don't know if I'm going to keep all of this. I'm not. I don't know if I can finish it all or not. Where is my? Uh, I thought I had something in here about the solstices. I don't. I don't know what happened. Hang on a second. I got to swap. There we go. Um, anyway, we, we know that the sun rises in the east, comes across the top of the sky, goes down in the west. But what we also know is that every year the sun goes down below the equator to the tropic of... I think it's Capricorn down in the south. I may be wrong. And then over a six-month period, it rises back. It goes over the equator. That is the spring equinox. And then it rises to the summer solstice, June 21st. And then after that, it starts going back down to the south again, to the equator. That's the autumnal equinox, fall equinox. Then down to December 21st to the southern tropic again. And it's a journey of just over 46 degrees. So the sun rises from the east to the west every day, but every year it rises from the south, goes to the north, comes back down from the north to the south again. It does it every year. It does it both ways. Somebody, that is so beautiful. I love that. Christ is the son of righteousness, S-U-N. He is the sun and the shield. His face is shining as the sun. He is the light of the world. And the way that the way that all plays out, it shows not only every day his death and resurrection, but it also and when he's at 12 noon, he's the most high, but every year it shows his descension and ascension into heaven. 
He shows us that. The heavens tell the glory of God. The firmament showeth his handiwork. Day unto day utter a speech, and night unto night showeth language. There's not, there's no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. And the Bible's telling you that you can see literally the death, burial, resurrection of Jesus Christ in the movements of the sun. I love this. Because who created it that way? Did Satan? No. But what does he do? He steals God's glory. So now watch. We have Mount Zion in the sides of the north. I've raved up one up from the north. Now in Ezekiel 8, here's the temple, and Ezekiel's going to go into the temple. And he put forth the form of an hand and took me by a lock of mine head, and the Spirit lifted me up between the earth and the heaven, and brought me in the visions of God to Jerusalem, to the door of the inner gate that looketh toward the north. Where was the Where? To the door of the north. Where was the seat of the image of jealousy, which provoketh to jealousy? And behold, the glory of the God of Israel was there according to the vision that I saw in the plain. Then said he unto me, Son of man, lift up thine eyes now toward the way toward the north. So I lifted up mine eyes the way toward the north, and behold, northward at the gate of the altar, this image of jealousy in the entry. It was all at the north. Jeremiah 46, 20, Egypt is like a very fair heifer, but destruction cometh, and it cometh from the north. Did you ever see the movie Stargate? Not the TV show, the original movie. In the original movie, what did they do? They discovered a gateway that opens up a wormhole. Basically, the folding, remember this, the folding of the fabric of the universe, just like that, putting the two points together. And so they step through the stargate and they find themselves in a wormhole. Now they're on a planet that's ruled over by who? An alien taking on the image of of an Egyptian pharaoh. Okay? Does that mean something? I don't know. It could be. But Egypt and Pharaoh are... Since we're dealing with this number four, the fourth kingdom, meaning the spiritual realm, how long were the Israelites in captivity under Pharaoh? 400 years, the Bible says. So Egypt then, I believe, represents this army. Because when Egypt decided, when Pharaoh decided that it was stupid to let these Jewish people go, he wasn't going to go get them back to be slaves. He was going to kill them. And... He gets in the middle of the sea. God led him in there, brought him in there, drew him in there, and then destroyed him, covered him up with the sea, which the word sea in the King James Bible, you'll love this one. 400 times exactly in your King James Bible. Wow. Jeremiah 46, 24, the daughter of Egypt shall be confounded. She shall be delivered into the hand of the people of the north. What people? Those people up there. Jeremiah 47, 2, thus saith the Lord, behold, waters rise up out of the north and shall be an overflowing flood and overflow the land and all that is therein the city and them that dwell therein and then the men shall cry and all the inhabitants of the land shall howl now God's already told us and I believe him that he would never ever 
flood the earth again with water. I believe him. And yet Jesus said, as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be at the coming of the Son of Man. So these waters that are rising and this flood that is coming is not regular earthly water. The book of Psalms talks about the flood of ungodly men, an evil nation flooding over the land and filling the land again. That's the flood that he's talking about. It is an evil army that all of us with our AR-15s, our semi-automatics or automatics, our bunkers, underground, our shelters, it's an army that we can't fight with bullets. We can't do it. So we have to put on the whole armor of God that we may be able to withstand in the evil day. And I believe the evil day is when these waters rise up out of the north. Genesis 6, 7, Behold, I will even bring a flood of waters upon the earth to destroy all flesh, wherein is the breath of life, and under heaven, and, and everything that is in the earth shall die. So where did the water, where did the water come from? And it came to pass after seven days that the waters of the flood were upon the earth. In the 600th year of Noah's life, in the second month, in the 17th day of the month, the same day, were all the fountains of the great deep broken up. I've listened to the talks that a man by the name of Phil Schneider has given. A man that had gone around making speeches at UFO conferences because he said that he worked at a secret underground military base in Dulce, New Mexico, and that he was actually sent down. There's an underground base there, and he was sent down a chamber on this lift and saw all these aliens down there. And he had a, I think it was a Navy SEAL or somebody trained with him that protected him, opened fire on them. They sent out some sort of, I don't know, electrical blue ray or something like that. And it destroyed some, the fingers on his left hand. He went around making this speech. And then all of a sudden he was found dead in his home after he had been there about three or four days. And I've seen the photographs. And at first they said that he died of a heart attack. Then when his family pushed for an autopsy, they found out that the police had taken pictures of him when he had died, when they found him. And he had, he had various illnesses w that took place, and he had these rubber catheter tubes wrapped tightly around his neck. And he died from suffocation. He died from strangulation. And they ruled it a suicide. So was he telling the truth? I don't know. But what I do know is, and there's a lot of other uh, things I may share with you sometime in the future, things that I've heard from you know, other people's testimony about not only deep underground bases, but also about underwater UFOs. Could very well be. But I know that the source 
of the flood that happened in the days of Genesis was that the fountains of the great deep broken up and the windows of heaven were opened. And that is precisely how it's going to happen in the last days. Angels, devils, aliens, whatever you want to call them, are going to be released from the pit that they're in, rise up out of the sea, and then they're going to descend down. From, actually, they're going to fall down from heaven like rain. The latter rain. And when that happens, they will take over this world. And there'll be no, and you guys have guys like Stephen Greer and Whitley Strieber and many others who are openly inviting these things to come to us and save us from evil politicians and the evil world that we live in and save us from capitalism and big oil and big industries and save us from this. We're all slaves. And remember what Jesus said, many shall come in my name saying, I am Christ and shall deceive many. Remember what Betty Andreessen said? When the aliens, the little gray aliens started taking her out of her home they were telling her that she had to go see the one capital O she had to go see the one and the one she believed was God Jesus Christ and that the one had chosen her to be like his ambassador. And I'm going, and this woman, Betty Andreessen, is supposed to be a Christian. Well, I'll say it like this. She's a Pentecostal that said that when she was quote-unquote baptized in the Holy Spirit, she later said when she was under hypnotic regression that there were these tall, white, what she called elders. They were aliens or angels, evil angels, that were there at the church when she quote-unquote got baptized with the Holy Ghost, and they are the ones who did it. While she was under hypnotic regression, she began to speak in a language that no one understood. No one did. Now it kind of clicks together, doesn't it? That's the setup. What got me going with Betty Andreessen was, I remember reading years ago that when she was a young girl, about 12 years old, she went out and saw this alien. There was a hole there or something like that. Anyway, this alien pulled something out of his pocket, released it, and this light came flying around her head. And when it zapped her on the forehead, she fell backwards, just like being slain in the spirit. And I'm going, are you kidding me? And notice that the waters prevailed upon the earth in 150 days in Genesis 7. In Revelation 9, that is the exact amount of days. There came out of the smoke locusts upon the earth, and unto them was given power as the scorpions of the earth have power. And it was commanded them that they should not hurt the grass of the earth, neither any green thing, neither any tree, but only those men which have not the seal of God in their foreheads. And to them it was given that they should not kill them, but that they should be tormented five months. And their torment was as the torment of a scorpion when he striketh a man. Mm, mm, mm. Same amount of time, five months, 150 days. Coincidence? No. Fulfillment of prophecy is what that is. Jeremiah 50, verse 9, For lo, I will raise and cause to come up against Babylon an assembly of great nations from the north country, and they shall set themselves in array against... Notice he says great 
an assembly of great nations from the north country because we know from Ezekiel that the four cherubs each one of them had a different a slightly different appearance um we know that there are devils that look like dragons, devils that look like owls, devils that look like satyrs or satyrs, however you pronounce it, tomato, tomato. We know that there are devils that look like bulls. We know that there are devils that look like, um, what was I going to say? I lost my train of thought. Locusts. So we know that there are multitudes of different types. We know that some of them look like chariots. So we know that there is a multitude of different appearances of angels. They're not all naked. In fact, I would say they're not, there are no naked baby with wings, cherubs flying around. I think that's a myth. It's not mentioned in the scriptures. But I have a theory about it. Of why you see cherubs as these little naked ain't little naked babies i have a theory about that i'm not going to get into that today i'm still working on it working on it for a long time i want scripture but there's going to be assembly of great nations from the north country and they shall set themselves in array against her from thence shall she be taken their arrow shall be as of a mighty expert man and none shall return in vain there again what army is using arrows now, think about that for a minute. An arrow is a dart. And what did Ephesians warn us about? That when we take on the shield of faith, we'll use that to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. People at this time we are not going to be able to use the sense of sight to save us. We're going to use the superpower of faith to save us when this happens. Guaranteed 100%. We walk by faith and not by sight. Behold, a people, Jeremiah 50, verse 41, a people shall come from the north, a great nation, and many kings shall be raised up from the coasts of the earth, and they shall hold the bow and lance. Again, outdated weapons. Unless they're of a higher dimension. They shall hold the bow and the lance. They are cruel and will not show mercy. Their voice shall roar like the sea. They shall ride upon horses. Again, archaic ways of fighting wars now. No one rides horses. Everyone put in array like a man to to the battle against thee, O daughter of Babylon. The king of Babylon hath heard the report of them, and, in his, and his hands waxed feeble, and anguish took hold of him, and pangs as of a woman in travail. That connection to 1 Thessalonians 5. Isaiah 14, 31. Howl, O gate, cry, O city, thou, whole Palestina, art dissolved, for there shall come from the north a smoke, and none shall be alone in his appointed times. 
And he opened the bottomless pit, and there arose a smoke out of the pit, as the smoke of a great furnace. And the sun and the air were darkened by reason of the smoke of the pit, and there came out of the smoke locusts upon the earth. See, that's the connection. There shall come forth from the north a smoke. Here's your smoke right here. And out of the smoke came locusts upon the earth, and unto them was given power as the scorpions of the earth have power. Ezekiel 26, 7, For thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I will bring upon Tyrus Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon. I don't, there is a difference, and I don't know if there is a, any big deal to it or not. In some places in the Bible, he's Nebuchadnezzar. In some places, he's Nebuchadnezzar. Now, I don't know if there's a significance in that. I tend to not believe that there is. I, I just thought I'd point that out. But anyway, he's a king of kings, and he's coming from where? He is a what? A king of kings. Well, isn't that what Daniel said about, let's see here, Daniel chapter 2, about Nebuchadnezzar. So he said, uh, let's see here. Uh Verse 31, Thou, O king, sawest, and behold, a great image, this great image, whose brightness was excellent, stood before thee, and the form thereof was terrible. This image's head was of fine gold, his breast, and his arms of silver, and his belly of thighs of brass. And he talks about this, and he said, This is the dream, and we will tell the interpretation thereof before the king. Thou, O king, art a king of kings. For the God of heaven hath given thee a kingdom, power, and strength, and glory. So here again, we have Nebuchadnezzar called a king of kings from the north. Now remember, Jesus is coming. And he is the king of kings and lord of lords. But this king, I believe, pretends to be a king of kings kings. I believe it's a pretense. He's not really Jesus. A king of kings from the north with horses, with chariots, with horsemen and companies and much people. Again, horses, chariots. The horses, I've just, I don't know, I'm just trying to reconcile this in my mind. Horses are what powers the chariots, right? Well, what was it that powered the Ezekiel chariot? It was the four living creatures. Because remember, their spirit was in the wheels. And wherever their spirit wanted to go, that's where the wheels went. These four living creatures and the wheels were connected together somehow by spirit. They were the power source. These angels, these cherubs, were the power source of the wheels to take the chariot wherever it needed to go. And I think the same thing about these. When they come with horses and chariots. You see the same thing in uh, Zechariah. The four chariots with the four horses that draw these chariots. You see it in Revelation chapter 6. The horse and his rider. I think they're all talking about the same thing. Now, uh, I'm almost out of time, but I'm almost done. Since we're talking about the north, there is a 
latitude line stretches around the north part. It's called the Arctic Circle. The word Arctic actually comes from the word bear. In the north, there is a constellation called Ursa Major. And in Ursa Major is Arcturus, which means the bear. Now, thy servant slew both, this is David, thy slew, servant slew both the lion and the bear. And this uncircumcised Philistine shall be as one of them, seeing he has defied the armies of the living God. The bear is a type of the Antichrist. 2 Kings chapter 2. This is the story after Elijah has gone up into heaven by a whirlwind. Elisha comes back into town. And the kids are making fun of him. And they went up from thence unto Bethel. And he was, as he was going by the way, there came forth little children out of the city and mocked him and said unto him, Go up, thou bald head. Go up, thou bald head. And he turned back and looked on them and cursed them in the name of the Lord. And there came forth two she-bears out of the wood and tear forty and two children of them. Da, da, da. Now what's the, what's the significance of that? The 42 children, I believe, represent the 42 months that the beast prevails upon the earth. Now, um, let's see how much scripture I have left. I got a few verses left. I might save them for next Tuesday. I don't know what we'll do. But I am convinced that there is an invasion coming. Not an invasion from Poland. It's not an invasion from the Canadians. The Eskimos aren't going to do it. They're not going to take over the world. I don't even believe it's Russia. I believe God is going to flood this earth again with these devils that rise up out of the pit, these strangers that fall down from heaven. Remember what the word strangers is associated with. Okay? Then you kind of get what I'm getting at. I've enjoyed being with you today. I've had this on my mind. I've been working on this. and I love this Bible. It's telling us everything that we need to know about what's coming and if you're studying something and you don't find it in the Bible study something else until you do find it in the Bible let God be true every man alive this is Pastor Mike God bless you I love you we'll see you next time pray for the people of Kenya pray for the plans that we believe that God is leading us into there. big things pray for us we love you bye